Hey, 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 everybody. It's Miss Mac, and I'm back on YouTube with a new book. We are going to be reading Omnivore's Dilemma. Omnivore's Dilemma. We're going to start off small since it's our first time with this new book. And we're just going to read the introduction today. And so your annotation focus. Remember, annotation is the art of taking notes and connecting to the text as you read it. And the beauty about annotation is that you get to write directly into your book. Now me, I just have a paper copy um, because my book has not come from Amazon yet. But once my book does come in, I will have my full book. So your annotation focus today is going to be evidence of a dilemma. Okay. The name of the book is called Omnivore's Dilemma. And so we want to answer the question, what is omnivore's dilemma? And I think the very first thing we need to know is what is an omnivore? And the second thing we need to know is what is a dilemma? So I'm going to give you one and I'm going to expect one. So I'm going to tell you what a dilemma is. And part of your annotation focus, again, is going to be looking for evidence of a dilemma. So a dilemma is a choice between two alternatives. So it's a problem that creates two different alternatives that you have to choose from. And because you're struggling to make a choice or you're not really sure, you have created a dilemma. So choice between two or more alternatives. So omnivore's dilemma, our annotation focus will answer the question, what is omnivore's dilemma? So let's jump right into it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here we go. Introduction. Before I began working on this book, I never gave much thought to where my food came from. I didn't spend much time worrying about what I should or shouldn't eat. Food came from the supermarket, and as long as it tasted good, I ate it. Now, who can relate to that? How many people go into the store, get your favorite snack, and think about, okay, where did it come from? Like, where do Takis come from? What what are they? Like, what do, do where do Doritos come from? What is that? I mean, are potato chips really potatoes? Okay, so this is something that the author is thinking about. Okay, really important. And I think that's something that you could highlight, underline, or circle. The fact that he never spent much time worrying about what, where food came from. So that's the perfect spot for a gist. Now I'm going to show you mine. It's probably going to look backwards. Hopefully if that's focused. But somewhere like right in here, I would write a quick gist. Never really thought about where food came from. Okay, remember, your annotation is you taking notes. You're creating a roadmap to understanding, okay? Just like you go somewhere and you use Waze or you use um, Google Maps to figure out how to get somewhere, that's what your annotation does. Your annotation creates a roadmap to understanding what you're reading. So make sure that you have that gist there. If you need to stop the video, do your thing, you need to have that gist. The author never really thought about where his food was coming from. Let's continue. Until that is, I had the chance to peer behind the curtain of the American food chain. This came in 1998. I was working on an article about genetically modified food. Food created by changing plant DNA in a laboratory. My reporting took me to the Magic Valley in Idaho, where most of the French fries you've ever eaten begin their life as russet Burbank potatoes. That's a really cool fact. So I would highlight, circle, or underline French fries come from Magic Valley in Idaho. And do a little gist. Maybe even draw, make a little drawing of some McDonald's French fries, right? You can make like a little French fry cup 
And remember, annotation doesn't have to be dead and boring. Annotation can be fun. So I'm drawing my little uh, French fry bag with some fries in it. And normally when I'm annotating, I have my colored pen and my colored pencils. And instead of putting McDonald's, I'm just going to put my initials on my little French fry bag. So annotation can be fun, right? It doesn't all have to be words. And so I've made that little drawing in the margin and I'm going to underline most French fries and then I'm going to circle Magic Valley in Idaho because that's where French fries come from. Let's continue. It was 15,000 acres divided into 135 acre crop circles. Each circle resembled the green face of a tremendous clock with a slowly rotating second hand. That sweeping second hand was the irrigation machine. Okay, let's stop right there. Can we circle irrigation? Because I'm not sure what irrigation is and I'm, I need to go back to that later and define that. So that sweeping second hand was the irrigation machine, a pipe more than a thousand feet long that delivered steady rain of water, fertilizer, and pesticide to potato plants. So he's describing a contraption or a machine that did what? That watered the crops of potatoes. And so this long pipe gave water, fertilizer, and pesticide to the potato plants. That's important to me. So let's underline rainwater, fertilizer, pesticide. And then I'm going to draw a little arrow to the margin and I'm going to say machine delivered to plants. Okay, so make sure that you're gisting and following along. Make sure that you're annotating. Annotating and gisting work together to help you make connections to what you're reading. So you'll probably never forget where French fries come from. And you'll always remember this little drawing that I made. So let's go on. You should be, you should have your page, your book open. If you have the physical book, you should have it open. Or you should be online on your document making these same notations. Sitting in that room, the farmer could, at the flick of a switch, douse his crops with water or whatever chemical he thought they needed. So douse, D-O-U-S-E, another vocabulary word. Let's circle that and we're gonna need a definition a little later. One of these chemicals was a pesticide called monitor used to control bugs. The chemical is so toxic to the nervous system that no one is allowed in the field for five days after it's sprayed. Even if the irrigation machine breaks during that time, farmers won't send a worker out to fix it because the chemical is so dangerous. They'd rather let that whole 135 acres crop of potatoes dry up and die. So hold the phone. So you mean to tell me that this irrigation machine, and irrigation is a vocab word that you will ultimately look up and figure out what that means, but we know that this machine waters the plants, feeds the plants, and sprays the plants with pesticide, which is essentially bug killer. But what the author is telling us is that the chemical that they spray on plants is so dangerous then no one can be in the field for five days. In fact, it's so dangerous, if something breaks down, they'd rather let the crop die than to send someone out to fix it. I think that's an important point. So what would you write in your margin? So I'm gonna draw this little box and I'm gonna show you this that indicates that what I put in this side of the margin pertains to all this information that I'm getting right here. And basically what I know is that the pesticides are dangerous, okay? What I just did was gist, okay? This is a gist, a brief note about what you've just read. 
the annotation is the bar that I drew that indicates that this gist refers to this paragraph. So he used all of those words to tell you that the pesticide was dangerous. And I would probably underline also the fact that um, this line, the chemical is so toxic to the nervous system that no one is allowed in the field for five days because that is your evidence that the pesticide is dangerous. Okay. Also, that last sentence in that paragraph, they'd rather let the whole crop die than send one, someone to fix it. So those that's two pieces of evidence that tell you how dangerous this pesticide is. Let's continue. That wasn't all. During the growing season, some pesticides got inside the potato plant so that they would kill any bug that takes a bite. But these pesticides mean people can't eat the potatoes while they're growing either. After the harvest, the potatoes are stored for six months in a giant shed. Here the chemicals gradually fade until the potatoes are safe to eat. Only then can they be turned into French fries. That's how we grow potatoes? I had no idea. So this paragraph is really important too because it gives me some insight as to how potatoes grow. So I'm not gonna tell you what to write this time, but I want you to give me a little gist that summarizes that paragraph. And your gist should be no more than five or six words. What can you write there that summarize what the author tells us about potatoes in that paragraph? So you can pause the video right here do your gisting. Okay, let's continue. A burger with your fries? A few years later, while working on another story, I found myself driving down Interstate 5, the big highway that runs between San Francisco and Los Angeles. I was on my way to visit a farmer in California's Central Valley. It was one of the most, it was one of those gorgeous autumn days when the hills of California are gold. Out of nowhere, a really nasty smell assaulted my nostrils. The stench of a gas station restroom sorely in need of attention. But I could see nothing that might explain the smell. All around me, there were the same blue skies and golden hills. Now, what can you write in your margin that gives you information about what this paragraph is about. So the first thing I'm gonna circle is working on another story, okay? Traveling, and then I'll just write stinky smell, okay? And then I'm putting a big old fat question mark because I don't know what that smell is. And now I'm curious about what that smell is, okay? Make sure that you have these gists and these annotations on your document as well. And then, very suddenly, the golden hills turn jet black on both sides of the highway, black with tens of thousands of cattle crowded into a carpet of manure that stretched as far as the eye could see. Okay, let's circle manure. M-A-N-U-R-E, what is that? Okay, tens of thousands of cattle, and we know that cattle are cows, crowded onto a carpet of manure that stretched as far as the eye could see. I was driving through a feedlot. Okay, I'm gonna box the word feedlot because I'm just wondering what that is. And then from my box, I'm gonna draw an arrow with a question mark to remind me to come back to that. And I'll show you what I did. See how I did that? My annotations, and I put a question mark because once I find out what a feedlot is, I will make a gist right here. All right, here we go. Let's go back. I was driving through a feedlot with tens of thousands of animals bellying up to the concrete trough 
that ran along the side of the highway for what seemed like miles. Okay, I don't know what a trough is, T-R-O-U-G-H. So I'm going to circle that as well, and I'm going to find out what that is. Behind them rose two vast pyramids, one yellow, the other black, a pile of corn and a pile of manure. The cattle, I realized, were spending their days transforming the stuff on one pile into the stuff of the other. So which do you think was going? Were the cows turning corn into manure or were they turning manure into corn? Okay, you answer that question for yourself. You may see that on the quiz, by the way. This is where our meat comes from? I had no idea. Suddenly, that Happy Meal of hamburger and fries looked a lot less happy. Okay, what does he mean by that? Let's just stop right there. Give me a gist. What do you think the author means when he says, suddenly, that Happy Meal didn't look so happy. What does he mean by that? Okay, and I want you to gist that. What does that mean? And this whole process of annotating and talking to yourself and making those com connections as you read only help you to understand better, okay? Comprehension is increased depending on how good your annotations or how good your notes are. So I like this. Let's go back to this. Suddenly that Happy Meal of hamburger and fries looked a lot less happy. Between the feedlot and the potato farm, I realized just how little I knew about the way our food is produced. The picture in my head, a small family farms with white picket fences and red barns and happy animals on green pastures was seriously out of date. So he had this picture in his mind about these beautiful farms with all of this green grass, lovely red barns, and beautiful healthy animals running around. And this is where our food comes from. But what he actually discovered was very different from that. Okay, here we go. Let's finish up. The omnivore's dilemma. Now I had a big problem. I went from never thinking about where my food came from to thinking about it all the time. So now, a couple of things. Contrast and compare. Okay, contrast and compare is when you look at both sides of a thing. So at the bottom of your paper, I want you to write a t make a T-chart. Write contrast and compare. Remember our annotation focus? Our annotation focus is to figure out what the omnivore's dilemma is. Okay, so let's contrast and compare some of the things. So on so he he contrasted and compared his so going in the middle, I'm gonna write views on farms. Okay. So on the one side, he thought farms were nice and um, beautiful places with happy animals. Okay. But what he saw on both of those trips was very different. And then he went from never thinking about food. What about food? Never thinking about where food came from. About where food came from to what? Now, always thinking about where food came from. Now, here's a question for you. And you can just answer this in your head. What changed his mind? You, I want you to come up with two specific details that tell us why the author changed his mind and went from never thinking about where his chips and snacks and cookies and french fries and burgers came from to now 
he couldn't stop thinking about it. Okay, let's read that again, just for emphasis. Now I had a big problem. I went from never thinking about where my food came from to thinking about it all the time. I started worrying about what I should and shouldn't eat. Just because food was in the supermarket, did that mean it was good to eat? Answer that question. Just answer yes or no. The more I studied and read about food, the more I realized I was suffering from a form of omnivore's dilemma. This is a big name for a very old problem. Human beings are omnivores. That means we eat plants, meat, mushrooms, just about anything. But because we are omnivores, we have very little built-in instinct that tells us which foods are good for us and which, which foods aren't. That's the dilemma. We can eat anything, but how do we know what to eat? Now, there's a whole lot there that really sets you up for what this entire book is about. And that's really the job of an introduction. So let's go back and figure out what are we going to highlight, underline, or circle as part of our annotation focus. So what is the omnivore's dilemma? Remember, you need to figure out what an omnivore is, okay? We know that a dilemma is when you have alternatives and you have to choose between them. So what then would the omnivore's dilemma be? Let's find some evidence. He said it was a big name for an old problem. So I would underline that and maybe make a little one and put a circle because that could potentially be a piece of evidence. You see how I underline that there and then put that one in the circle? Let's continue. Human beings are omnivores. That means we eat plants, meat, mushrooms, just about anything. Okay, so we eat just about anything. So I would underline we eat and then underline just about anything and put a little two there. So that's a second piece of evidence that's giving me information about what the dilemma is. So the first thing he told us is that it was a huge and very old problem. The second part of the dilemma is the fact that we can eat and do eat anything. And then what does he say is the problem with being able to eat anything? Okay, what is the, why is that a problem? I'm going to write that question down. I want you to figure that out. Why is being able to eat anything a problem? Okay, so take some time, write that question at the top of your page or type it if you're working virtually online. And he tells us right here. Okay, let me go back. He says, and I want you to be able to answer this question. I'm just going to read what the, what the book says. But because we are omnivores, we have very little built-in instinct that tells us which foods are good for us and which foods aren't. That's the dilemma. We can eat anything, but how do we know what to eat? The omnivore's dilemma has been around a long time. But today, we have a very modern form of this dilemma. We have a thousand choices of food in our markets. Okay, so thousands of choices. I would underline that. Again, he says the dilemma has been around for a long time. I would also underline that. That could be a piece of evidence. And then I would also go up one more and underline, we can eat anything, but how do we know what to eat? And then in the margin, I'm just going to write the word dilemma. Okay. Remember, anything you underline, circle, or highlight has to have a gist that explains why you underlined. Okay. So he says, we have thousands of choices of food in our supermarkets, but we don't really know where the food comes from. Now, do you think that's a problem? Don't really know where the food comes from. I'm going to little put an arrow here and write, hmm, could 
be a problem. Okay? We don't know where the food came from or where it's been. And in my mind, that could be a problem. So let me show you how I did that because we're learning together. So here I highlighted. We really don't know where the food comes from. And then I drew an arrow and wrote, hmm, this could be a problem. Okay? Continuing. In the past, people knew about food because they grew it or hunted it themselves. They learned about food from their parents and grandparents. They cooked and ate the same foods people in their part of the world had always eaten. Modern Americans don't have strong food traditions. Instead, we have dozens of different experts who give us lots of different advice about what to eat and what not to eat. Here's a question for you. Circle experts, he put those in quotes. Why did he put those in quotes? Okay, be able to answer that. Why did he put that in quotes? He said, instead, we have dozens of different experts who give us lots of different advice about what to eat and what not to eat. It's one thing to be crazy about food because you like to eat, but I found I was going crazy from worrying about food. So I set out to try to solve the modern omnivore's dilemma. I decided to become a food detective to find out where our food comes from and what actually it is that we are eating. My detective work became the book you now hold in your hands. As a food detective, I had to go back to the beginning, to the farms and the fields where our food is grown. Okay, so in this margin, I'm gonna write beginning of food journey okay and then I'm gonna do dot 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 farms okay that's the beginning of the food journey really important as a food detective I'm gonna read that again I had to go back to the beginning to the farms and the fields where our food is grown then I followed it each step of the way and watched what happened to our food on its way to our stomachs. Each step was another link in the chain, a food chain. A food chain is a system for growing, making, and delivering food. In this book, I follow four different food chains. Each one has its own section. Now, this is important because he's basically giving you a roadmap to his book and what it's about. And here they are. You look at industrial, you look at industrial organic, you look at local sustainable food, and that's food that's grown in your communities, and you look at hunter-gatherer. All these food chains in the same way, with a meal. And so, I thought it important to end each section of the book with a meal. Whether it was a fast food hamburger eaten in a speeding car or a meal I made myself from start to finish. So that was a great introduction. There's a lot of information. I'm expecting to look at your annotations and see those annotations that I gave. And I also expect to see answers to those questions that we asked ourselves as we were reading, as well as definitions for the words that we circle, okay? This is all a part of becoming a strong reader and improving your comprehension. That is your ability to understand and connect with what you're reading. That's all for now. We out.